Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Khaldun Azari. I'm former president of the club and uh, director at this uh, year's board. And I have the honor to moderate this uh, event, luncheon, today. We are coming back to lunch uh, events, so I hope uh, more in the future will be ahead of us. Mr. Paul Scheer, the former vice chairman of uh, s and B. Global, and the main theme of the uh, event, the talk will be on money dispelling the myth and misunderstandings. And uh, Mr. Paul Sheard is an Australian-American globally well-known and respected economist who has challenged the conventional wisdom about what money actually is and how it can be used. In uh, that was in his recently published best-selling book, The Power of Money. We have a copy here. Uh, maybe later you can uh, take a look at that uh, book. One of the most challenging assertions is that uh, government's debt doesn't have to be repaid. That's according to his uh, theory in the book. Uh, this appears to be very good news uh, indeed for uh, to governments around the world that are highly in debt, not least Japan. But how can it be? Uh, this we, we will hear about this a lot in the uh, presentation. And uh, Paul Chirt is a former vice chairman of S&B Global, as I said, and for a former uh, senior fellow uh, and uh, research fellow at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School. Uh, he held chief economist uh, positions also at uh, uh, Nomura Securities and Lehman Brothers and was Jan Japan's strategist and head of Japanese investments at Baring Asset Management. He was lecturer in economics at the Australian National University and associate professor of economics at Osaka University. He speaks Japanese also, by the way. Uh, and he held the visiting positions uh, at uh, Standard University, Stanford University and uh, the Bank of Japan. Uh, he has a Master of Economics and PhD from uh, Australian National University. In, 19, uh, in 2019, it, uh, his uh, alma mater, uh, Monash University, conferred on him an uh, honorary doctor of law. Today he will speak about the themes of his new book, focusing particularly on the implications for Japan. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest speaker, Mr. Uh, Paul Sheard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Calvin, for that uh, very uh, generous introduction. And uh, may I say that it's always a distinct uh, honor and pleasure uh, to be presenting at the uh, very august uh, Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan, even in your new location. I used to enjoy the old location as well, but they're both very nice venues. Um, so thank you for giving me the, the opportunity to share uh, some of my thoughts about my new book, The Power of Money. Um, if you look in the book, you will not actually see a chapter on Japan, but a lot of the uh, ideas and the thinking behind the, the book come from my uh, 17 years living in Japan and studying the uh, Japanese economy and particularly uh, its monetary policy and fiscal policy. So I, in, in writing this book, I wanted to write this book for a general audience, not for a kind of a technical audience of economists or you know, policy makers per se, although hopefully they will find that uh, the, the book interesting and, and stimulating and maybe controversial. Um, but I wanted to uh, really focus on uh, the sort of basics of money. And money's a little bit like water is to a fish, in the sense that you know, money is intrinsic to the economy. Everybody knows about money. Everybody worries about money. Um, everybody uh, has some money, hopefully. Um, but there are a lot of kind of misunderstandings, if you like, myths even, about some fundamental aspects of money. And so I try to kind of explain the basics in the book. Now, I'm an economist, and uh, economists tend to look at money a, a couple of ways. If you pick up any economic textbook introduction to uh, economics, or you turn to the chapter on money, I can guarantee in the first page or so, there'll be a statement that money is uh, 
a unit of account, that is, we, we count things in money, yen in Japan, dollars in the US. It is a medium of exchange. It's very important that we can use money to exchange for goods and services, uh, rather than operate in a barter economy where you had to do you know, exchange goods. So money allows the economy, the wheels of the economy to turn because it's a very convenient form of exchange. And then the third function that will be talked about is money as a store of value. Money is purchasing power, medium of exchange, and you can transfer that purchasing power through time to next year or 10 years' time, 20 years' time. Uh, so it's a store of economic value or purchasing power. So, but that definition of money is kind of describes the functions of money. And then that usually goes into a discussion that Many different things can become money, even cigarettes in prisoner of war, uh, among prisoners of war in, in, in uh, prison camps, or shells in Pacific Islands, or even big rocks in some uh, locations. So lots of interesting stories like that. Um, but it tells you sort of what money has to, uh, what functions it has to serve to be regarded as money. The second thing, then, economists will tend to leap to measuring money, and we have these various M's. M for money, I guess. M0, or monetary base, which is basically the money that uh, is issued by the central bank, so the, the right-hand side of the central bank's balance sheet, so that's uh, reserves, accounts that commercial banks have at the central bank, and banknotes in, in circulation. That's M0, and then there's M1, and M2, and M3. And so what economists do there is try to define or measure uh, various kinds of money. So, you know, money sitting in bank accounts, money sitting on term deposit in bank accounts, uh, money in uh, money market mutual funds, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's, that's all well and good, and there's lots of debates about, you know, which part of the money supply or the stock of money should be in what category. Um, you all get a little bit confused after a while. But what that doesn't tell you is... Uh, a more interesting question to me, or at least something I think is, is is basic question that citizens should understand, is how does money get into the economy to begin with? How does money get into circulation? And again, if you read the uh, economic uh, textbooks or monetary history books, there'll be a lot of discussion of historically how the institution of money evolved from coins and, you know, banknotes uh, and uh, gold and bullion, and et cetera, and sort of history of how central banking came into existence, et cetera, et cetera. So this book doesn't talk about that so much, but rather starts by saying, well, how does money get into the economy? And I usually find myself at this point reaching for, uh, well, in Japan, it will be a, a 10,000 10, yen uh, bill. I usually, I think I have a a $20 bill here from uh, the US. But this is, is clearly the, you know, the very basic form of money. And you could ask yourself, well, OK, I have this in my wallet. How did this money get into uh, existence? Um, now, maybe I got it when I went to a shop for change, or probably I got it from the bank, from the ATM. But that means it came out of a bank deposit. Uh, and bank deposits are a part of Again, money supply M1 or M2, depending on how, you know, whether it's a demand deposit or a, uh, a term deposit. So then you could just reframe the question, well, how did the money get into the bank account to begin with? Well, you might think, well, you know, I work and my employer put the money in my bank account. Every payday I get my money. But that just shifts the question one stage. Where did your employer get that bank deposit from? Well, they sold some newspapers or they sold some products. So they got it from their customers. But again, where did the customers get the money from? So you go round and round in circles. So enough suspense. Uh, there, there are three, really two to three main ways in which money gets into the economy. Uh, and I'll, 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 I'll talk about them uh, in the context of sort of the myths and misunderstandings. So I'm, I'm going to share with you five kind of misunderstandings, common misunderstandings about the money system, the monetary system. Um, now, the first one is a, a, a misunderstanding that runs very deep, which is that banks, when they lend, you know, banks lend money, and 
many people think that banks take in deposits, collect deposits, and they lend those deposits to their borrowers. Now, uh, that's not true. Actually, what banks do is they create money when they lend. The act of a bank making a loan is the very act of creating money. Credit creation, lending is money creation. Now, and that's really the most important way in a modern economy like Japan's or the US that money gets into circulation in the first place. Now, that money ultimately has to be repaid when you get a bank loan for a mortgage, for a house, or a car to buy a car or something. Of course, the premise is that you'll pay that money back. So that money will eventually disappear. But in a, in a, in a growing economy, the rate at which new loans are created usually is bigger than the rate at which old loans are being retired. So bank lending tends to create a net amount of money, a substantial amount of money. I mean, in Japan at the moment, the end of the f uh, March, uh, there was something like $577 trillion of bank lending. And if we look at money, if we look at M2, for example, something like 1,240 trillion yen of bank, of of, of demand and, and term deposits and cash in circulation, etc. So these are big numbers. By the way, the Japanese economy is about, uh, at last count, something like 589 trillion yen. 589 trillion yen. Um, so, you know, quite a few trillion dollars. So these are big numbers. So that's one of the main ways in which money comes into existence. Now, it doesn't feel like that to an individual bank, because when a bank makes a loan, the premise is the borrower is going to take that money and spend it, use it for some purpose, buy an asset or take a holiday or do something with it. So the bank will typically, the deposit money it has created will lose that money, it will go to another bank. But oftentimes, if it's a big bank, some of that money will come back into it again. But other banks will now find themselves with more deposits, and uh, that money will circulate in the economy. So for the banking system as a whole, uh, loans are essentially self-financing, because they, the loan itself creates the deposit, the deposit moves around. But at the aggregate level, uh, and it's always very important to bear in mind the distinction between whether we're looking at the monetary system at an aggregate level or at an individual institution level, you get different answers. But aggregate level, uh, it, that's the, the case. Now, the second kind of myth or misunderstanding, uh, and it's already kind of been alluded to by Calden, is that this idea that budget deficits, the government running a budget deficit, is somehow bad. You know, if possible, it would be better to have a balanced budget, maybe even a surplus. Uh, and the government is often compared to a household. I mean, we cannot keep running deficits. We'll go bankrupt. So how can the government run deficits? Well, that's the wrong way to think about it. And a budget deficit is simply uh, occurs when the government is putting more money into the economy, essentially writing checks, issuing IOUs, like these bits of paper, but in electronic form, then it's taking out of the economy in taxes. And most governments run a budget deficit. So if the, if the government is injecting more money into the economy than it's taking out, that's a budget deficit. That's actually creating money. And so budget deficits are the second way in which money is created and is injected into the economy. So just as a first pass at budget deficits, um, I, you, know, you can actually think of them as a, being a, a, a good thing, a necessary thing. It's one of the ways in which money gets into the economy. And the very first words in my book are from the cabaret uh, Broadway show, money makes the world go round. Without money, we would not really have a functioning economy generating this much prosperity. Um, that leads me to the third kind of myth or misunderstanding that Calden has just already alluded to is government debt. Now, government debt, of course, it's a big issue in Japan, and people all around the world actually look at Japan because of Japan's mountain of debt, and we never cease hearing about 
the mountain of debt in Japan. Uh, how big is that mountain? It's something like $1,230 trillion of government bonds have been issued in Japan. So that's a, it's, more, it's around about twice or even more than twice the size of the economy. So that's a very big, big uh, number. But bank government debt in and of itself, in principle, does not have to be repaid. And actually, debt is a misnomer because when you say debt, well, a debt means you have to repay. It's better to think about government debt or you know, Japanese JGBs or treasuries in the US as being a form of money created by the government. Now, you can have too much money in an economy. And if you have too much money, and that money, because that money is purchasing power, and if that purchasing power is being released into the economy, it can overwhelm the ability of the economy to produce goods and services, guess what you will get? Inflation. And we just saw worldwide a, a very graphic example of that in the last couple of years, uh, where uh, after COVID, a lot of money was created through governments running budget deficits. Central banks played a part. I'll come to that in a moment. And damage had been done to the real economy, particularly to the labor markets. There was not as much labor supply available as uh, compared to pre-COVID, and suddenly this purchasing power, this money, overwhelmed the capacity of the economy to produce the necessary goods and services, and then we got high inflation. In the US, CPI went to, I think, something like 8.9% year on year. Should be around about 2, 2.5%. So when we say that government debt doesn't have to be repaid per se, it doesn't mean there's nothing to worry about. It doesn't mean, oh, governments can print and create as much money as they like. It just means we should understand, have a correct understanding of what's going on here. Fundamentally, government debt, or JGBs in Japan, treasuries in the US, are not much different from this paper money. Uh, this is a uh, liability, a kind of an IOU of the Bank of Japan, this one, is an IOU of the uh, US federal government, the Treasury in particular. If you took this note into a bank and said, I want my money back, you could hand it to the teller, and the teller would give it back to you. So the government never has to repay this debt. It just is purchasing power in the economy. Now, government debt is a couple of stages removed from this, but fundamentally, it's really not much different. It looks like it has to be repaid because we're used to thinking of a 10-year JGB or a five-year JGB or a two-year uh, treasury bill. And that means that at the end of two years or five years or 10 years, whenever the, mature, the repayment uh, date comes up, the government has to repay that particular uh, JGB but it does that by issuing new JGBs, um, and the money just is essentially rolled over continuously. Now, you're still probably thinking, mm, I'm not sure if I really uh, believe that, so let me move on to the fourth misunderstanding and myth, uh, and, and, and come back to the point. And the, the fourth one is that central banks print money. So again, we're thinking about how does money get into the economy? One is bank lending, one is government deficits. Third one is central banks. Isn't it the central banks that print money? Um, particularly in this age of quantitative easing, QE, or in Japan, since 2016, uh, sorry, 2013, uh, QQE. Since 2016, QQE with yield curve control. Um, but quantitative easing. So quant what is quantitative easing? Well, first of all, here in Japan, um, and of course, quantitative easing was a policy which was pioneered by the Bank of Japan. In March 2001, for five years, the Bank of Japan did quantitative easing. And in those days, QE was a curiosity. Uh, other central banks said, oh, wow, the Bank of Japan is doing this strange policy called QE. But then with the global financial crisis, what in Japan people call the Lehman shock. It was much bigger than that. 
I was the chief economist at Lehman Brothers at the time, so <laughs> let me tell you, it was not just Lehman Brothers. Uh, with the global financial crisis, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the ECB, they all started doing QE as well. And the Bank of Japan joined in again uh, as well under Governor Shirakawa. And then we get to COVID and the Bank, uh, the Fed, ECB, all of these central banks that had been retreating from QE started doing it on an even bigger scale, massive scale. And new central banks like the Reserve Bank of Australia, uh, Bank of Canada joined in as well. So this policy, this uh, monetary policy of quantitative easing pioneered, uh, I don't think they copyright, copyrighted it, but pioneered by the Bank of Japan has become this global standard for monetary policy when interest rate ammunition has been depleted and the central bank needs to do more monetary easing. So if you look at, again, just let me tell you what QE is. QE is when the central bank purchases assets, usually government debt securities, but not just that, sometimes risk assets like the Bank of Japan has done, but typically uh, government debt securities, government bonds, and pays for them, that's on one side of the balance sheet, the asset side, on the other side of the balance sheet, they just create money, uh, what are called reserves, or in Japan are called current account deposits. These are deposits that the, that the banks and some other financial institutions have at the Bank of Japan. You might have a bank account with Citibank or Sumitomo, Mitsui, uh, or not advertising anybody here, but uh, I, I happen to have bank accounts in those banks. Uh, you might have bank accounts with them, but those banks have bank accounts with the central bank, the Federal Reserve or the Bank of Japan. And so with a magic wand, the Bank of Japan or any of these central banks can just start uh, creating those accounts, and that's part of what's called base money or monetary base, so it's money, and purchase uh, government bonds and other assets. So you might say, well, isn't that printing money? And yes, it is technically printing money, but I think it's, a, it's not really very helpful to think about it in those terms, because what QE is doing is and just, I'll say this slowly because it's a little bit technical, but the best way to think about quantitative easing when the central bank is buying government bonds is as a debt refinancing operation of the consolidated government where the consolidated government via the central bank retires government bonds, takes them out of circulation and refinances them into central bank reserves or current account balances. So it's switching, the com it's switching the profile, it's changing the profile of the existing stock of government created money or debt. So I'm a little bit different from typical economists. Economists, when they do those different M's, don't include government bonds in the money supply. And I think that's rather, I don't think that's actually the right way to think about it. I think it's better to think of government bonds. It's just another form of government created money and but typically the, when the government runs a budget deficit it's creating more money than it's taking out and it changes that money into government bonds. QE just reverses it. It takes it back to a more primitive state when it, <coughs> pardon me, where now you have a lot more uh, money in, in the system. But in terms of net purchasing power Quantitative easing doesn't create any more purchasing power. You, you take a, you know, a yen of government bonds out of the system and you put a yen of current account uh, deposits or reserves back in. So the net injection of purchasing power through QE is actually zero. Now, that, you might say, well, hold on a minute. If that's the case, why bother doing it? Well, there, it does have some effect on monetary conditions and financial conditions. I won't go into the details of that. It might be a little bit too technical. So it's worth doing, but it's not uh, as big a deal as it looks when you see the size of the central bank balance sheet. So for example, if you go back to April 2013, when uh, under Governor Kuroda, the Bank of Japan launched QQE, quantitative and qualitative easing, the, the size of the uh, Bank of Japan's balance sheet was 164 trillion. 
$164 trillion, uh, trillion yen. Now, the latest number, it's $748 trillion. So it's gone up, you know, almost, um, well, you can do the arithmetic, maybe five times or, or something like that. It's a huge expansion. What you don't see when you look at those numbers is the amount of JGBs that have been withdrawn from the economy and taken back inside the government, uh, essentially temporarily cancelled, because the central bank is part of the government. So Q QE is an important tool, but it's not the main way in which money is created. In fact, it's debatable whether it creates any real money, depending on how you uh, define it. By the way, a little bit, to get a little bit technical, one of the Im really important changes that has taken place in central banking in the last 15 years or so is that central banks now are able to pay interest on reserves. So the, this is a liability of the Bank of Japan. It has, you get zero interest for holding this. The electronic version of this that commercial banks hold and they now hold a lot of them, something like uh, 539 trillion yen of ele electronic reserves uh, on the balance sheet of the banking system and the Bank of Japan. Uh, typically, historically, those reserves did not get an interest rate either. So if you go back to the first episode of quantitative easing with the Bank of Japan, 2001 to 2006, the Bank of Japan did not pay any interest on the reserves that it created, the current account balances that it created when it did quantitative easing. And that meant that when it exited from quantitative easing, it wanted to raise the interest rate, which it did under Governor Fukui in June 2006. First of all, it had to get rid of those excess reserves. It had to shrink its balance sheet. Well, all of that has changed. And the central banks now have the ability, legal ability, uh, authority from the government, to pay interest on reserves. Now, that's not an issue in Japan at the moment, because the interest rate is you know, around about zero, minus 10 basis points plus 10 basis points, depending on which part of the reserves you look at. The Bank of Japan has a complicated three-tiered system, but a rough around about zero. But the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates by uh, 525 basis points in the last year and a half, and has a huge amount of reserves on its balance sheet. So now the Fed is paying, the interest rate at the moment is 5.4% to the banks, uh, on the balances that the banks hold at the Fed because of all of this quantitative easing. And a lot of people worry about that, but what that, don't worry about it, sleep easy, because those reserves at the Fed or the Bank of Japan are in a sense just like government bonds because now the Treasury or the Ministry of Finance in Japan, they, they don't really have to pay interest on those bonds. Well, they pay to the Bank of Japan, another part of the government, the money comes back again. So now, rather than the Treasury having this government debt and paying interest to the public, now the central bank is paying interest to the banking system, and the banking system is, to some extent, pass, will, will at some point pass that on to depositors. So the, the way in which interest is being paid on the stock of government debt under QE shifts from the Treasury to the central bank. But again, it's still all under the same household. Imagine in your household, I don't know, husband and wife, um, sometimes the husband pays the bill, sometimes the wife pays the bill. It's coming out of the same household. Same thing with quantitative easing. Um, probably got a little bit too technical there, but it's, it's hard to uh, get all of this across without uh, getting a little bit technical. The fifth way, and, and by the way, but let me just one very important point to come back to this issue, Calden, of governments not really having to pay uh, re re to to um, repay debt. There's one critical difference when, again, I'll use the the J Japanese example here. When the Bank of Japan has all these JGBs and has created all of these reserves, uh, liabilities to the banking system. Again, that's 539 trillion yen at the moment that the Bank of Japan has. 
if you look at the Bank of Japan numbers. Used to be 58. When QQE started, it was 58 trillion. Now it's 539 trillion. And the Bank of Japan, well, we'll see what happens on Friday. But sooner or later, hopefully, under Governor Ueda, uh, the Bank of Japan will start raising its interest rate. That will be an occasion to pop the champagne in Japan because Japan's been stuck at the zero bound for uh, decades now. And so normalizing monetary policy, that would be good. But there's one difference between the Bank of Japan paying interest on reserves and the Treasury paying interest on JGBs is that those central bank reserves never have to be repaid. So when banks have sold their JGBs to the Bank of Japan, now have reserves, deposits at the Bank of Japan, there's no date by which the Bank of Japan says, oh, you get your money back now. In fact, the Bank of Japan itself controls the aggregate amount of reserves in the banking system. Now, you might say, but hold on a minute, that's money, and all that money will cause inflation at some point. Well, the central bank now can raise the interest rate. That's called tightening monetary policy. And so uh, the, there's a real difference here, which is to say, well, if you don't believe my proposition that the, that the government debt doesn't actually have to be repaid, do a mental experiment and think for a moment that the Bank of Japan bought all of the JGBs in issuance. They have about half at the moment. Well, let's say they buy them all. And if they need to raise the interest rate to control inflation, they can raise the interest on those reserves, 1%, 2%, 5%, 10%, any number. But that stock of reserves, by definition, doesn't have to be repaid. Now, again, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. Uh, it, there might be various reasons that you don't want that much government debt. I mean, one very simple reason is, and maybe this is more germane to the debate in the US, is that a big government, big government deficits and a, and a big stock of government debt is essentially likely to be associated with big government. And big government lean means perhaps less of a role for the market economy. So there might be very good economic, political, ideological reasons for people to oppose a lot of government debt because that's a sign of a big government sector and maybe you don't like that. And another reason, of course, is what I mentioned before, that is too much government created money can lead to inflation. Now, I said the, bank, the central bank should be able to control that inflation, but to do so, it may have to hike interest rates very high and that can have negative effects on the economy. It can have distributional effects, monetary policy has distributional effects, just like fiscal policy does. So again, I want to impress, I'm not saying here you don't need to worry about government debt. I'm saying, no, you can worry about it, but the government debt doesn't have to be repaid per se. So that should not be the reason that you invoke, or the Ministry of Finance invokes, or the politicians, the fiscal hawks, invoke not to have some government expenditure. And the, the last myth, I won't spend too much here because I think we're coming against the clock, is you have all these reserves sitting on the central bank's balance sheet and also on the banking system's balance sheet. And a lot of people kind of talk and think as if the banks could use those reserves to lend them out to the private sector. And that this big buildup of monetary base is a kind of inflation accident waiting to happen because the, the banks might wake up one day and decide to lend those reserves. Well, don't worry about that either because banks cannot lend the reserves that they have at the central bank outside the banking system. They can lend them and they do lend them and they are supposed to lend them to other banks. But those reserves are essentially trapped inside the banking system. Um, they're not going to leak into the, into the real economy. Now, banks might decide to increase their own banking le bank lending and create new money, as we talked about at the very beginning, but that's not directly related to those reserves per se. So sometimes people talk about this in terms of the money multiplier collapsing. Money multiplier means the ratio of broad money, something like M2, to narrow money monetary base. And because quantitative easing increases the monetary base, that ratio falls. 
And so some people say, well, you know, the money multiplier has collapsed, but it might go up again, meaning you know, a, a lot of credit creation might happen. But that cannot happen and will not happen directly because banks lend those reserves. They don't, doesn't operate that way. Um, so let me stop there. I think we've covered a fair bit of territory. Um, three ways in which money gets into the system, bank lending, budget deficits, and to a certain extent, but not really, through central bank quantitative easing. Thank you very much for your insights, very de educational. And now we'd like to open the floor uh, to a Q&A session. Uh, please, if you have a question, raise your hand and proceed to the mic here so we can uh, record your uh, question. And uh, I forgot to welcome our people watching online uh, this event. Who would like to take the first question? All right. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Yusuke Wada. I'm an associate member here. Um, for the past, um, first past session you were here in 2019, uh, November 2019, you talked about the mon monetary policies of Japan and the uh, GDP of the of back then. And I just did my uh, checking now. The USA was 21.4 trillion, and right now it's uh, back in the 20. 2019, now it's up to 25.5 trillion. China was 14.3 million uh, trillion, and it's down up to 17.7. Japan was 5.1 trillion, and that down to 4.9 trillion uh, 2022. And as you know, the monetary policy doesn't exist for the banks. So the banks follow the mon po monetary policies, and. Um, for the conservative monetary policies, do you think for the Japanese government, do you think it was correct since the interest rate of the other countries are so high now, they can't sustain themselves now, but Japan is very sustainable. Um, do you have any uh, opinion on that? Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Wada-san, uh, for that question. And uh, well, first of all, thank you for remembering my talk from November 2019. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's very impressive. Um, and you, you, you rattled off some numbers there. I'm, I'll have to trust you on the numbers, but let me, let me just uh, tell you some numbers. Uh, you know, it's, we've been through this period since I was here last time, of course, through the pandemic. And this has really been one of the, you know, I, I thought, you know, having cut my teeth in Japan and, you know, the bubble economy and non-performing loan problem, and then I went to the US and Lehman Brothers happened, the global financial crisis. Um, I thought I'd seen most things, but um, COVID and what happened after COVID is just off the charts. Um, now, it was a very unique uh, episode, what happened, of course, with the lockdowns and the, 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 sh the shutdown of economic activity in some countries essentially cutting themselves off from the rest of the world. Um, Australia, for example, was like that. And the the negative shock to GDP, you mentioned the GDP numbers, in the first half of 2019, uh, sorry, 2020, and particularly the second quarter, was just unbelievable. In the US, for example, in the first half, and most of it in the second quarter, GDP fell about 10%. Um, on an annualized basis, that's about 20%. Uh, uh, unemployment rate in the US went just in two months from 3.5% to 14.7%, so more than 11 percentage points. And I could go on with these numbers. These, the, these numbers we've never seen before, such big contraction in GDP and big increase in unemployment. Then, of course, the, the economy has opened up with the vaccines and changes in policies, different countries at different paces, and then we had the big money printing through the fiscal deficits that was really the main channel. And then a lot of quantitative easing, which you know, made sure that that money that was being injected into the economy through very big budget deficits stayed as you know, pure money and not, was not converted into bonds, as would normally be the case. Then we had the recoveries. So where are we now? Um, I like to look at like, the end of Q4, uh, and because that, you know, we've had the big fall and then the recovery. And where are we now with the latest GDP numbers? So US GDP is up about 6% relative to the end of 2019. Japan is up about 3%, uh, which is not too bad, actually. You know, 
the, under the circumstances. And the, and the euro area is up about 2.6%. So on, on that uh, metric, Japan's looking okay. There's a little bit of a, a perhaps a footnote there, because um, if you remember, in October 2019, just before the COVID, uh, Japan increased the consumption tax from 8 to 10%. That caused some front-loading in the third quarter, and fourth quarter GDP fell. And that was the first quarter before COVID. So if you, if you do the comparison relative to Q3 2019, Japan's kind of flat. But anyway, um, Japan, Japan's you know, economic performance has not been obviously as good as the US. You also mentioned China. Um, and of course, everybody at the moment is worrying about, well, a lot of people are worrying about China, the Chinese economy, and the unwinding of the real estate bubble or overinvestment exuberance there, and I'm you know, even myself getting lots of questions like, do you think China is going the way of Japan into a kind of lost decades kind of scenario? Um, let me uh, let me just park that for the moment and come back to it. But just sticking with Japan for a moment. Uh, one thing when you look at the, 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 the most recent economic data is, you know, inflation has picked up in Japan as well. And that means that for the first time for many years, uh, G nominal GDP is expanding faster than real GDP. And that's the normal situation for an economy. That's the effect of inflation. For the last two decades or so, Japan's been, in, it's been flipped because Japan has had macro level deflation. Real GDP has been growing at a faster rate than nominal GDP. And that's, you know, there's a reason that we, society assigns to the central banks that the role of securing about 2% inflation with its monetary policy is we want a bit of grease in the wheels of the economy. And everybody feels a little bit better, a little bit more warmer if there's a little bit of inflation, not too much, but a little bit of inflation. So it seems to me that when I look at the data, the good news is that you know, nominal GDP is actually moving up quite sharply at the moment, partly because real GDP is picking up, but actually a little bit of inflation is coming back. And I've been, as you may know, Wadasan, from previous um, talks I've given, uh, a big supporter of using very aggressive monetary and particularly fiscal policy to get the Japanese economy out of this chronic, mild, deflationary funk that it's been in for a couple of uh, decades. And I was, now, the Governor Kuroda did a valiant job with QQE, and we looked at some of the numbers before. There was a real shift between Governor Shirakawa and Governor Kuroda um, and so I, I was a very big supporter of what Governor Kuroda did at the Bank of Japan because I think you need that very aggressive monetary policy. However, what also happened over that 10-year period is that the fiscal hawks in Japan succeeded in increasing the consumption tax rate from 5% to 10%. And what that does is drains purchasing power out of the economy. Raising taxes means the government takes money out of the economy. Now, depending on the circumstances, that might be a sensible thing to do. But if your main macroeconomic policy goal is to get the economy out of deflation, back into mild inflation, that's a really stupid thing to do. And so I believe, and I've said this many times over the years, that um, that sort of fiscal tightening, fiscal uh, consolidation agenda in Japan was you know, maybe the right policy at the wrong time. It was not the appropriate policy for Japan. Just coming back to China, and just a, a word on China, if I may. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not deep in the weeds of all the Chinese data, and the Chinese data is not as easy to get as Japanese data or the US data. But um, I'm a little bit skeptical of the view that China is going the way of Japan um, for a couple of reasons, if I just mentioned them. Uh, one is that in the 1990s, when Japan went into you know, the bubble burst and Japan went into deflation, it was already, you know, it had had its high growth period. It was already quite a, a rich country, and its potential growth rate was, was much lower. 
China's stage of economic development is, is much earlier. So China has a lot more economic development p potential. It doesn't mean it will be able to realize that. Not every country becomes a, a very rich country. Um, but it has a track record of now uh, 40 years of, of steady, high economic growth. It's running into some problems. Um, but in principle, it should be able to continue to grow at a, at a relatively decent rate. Now, it does have some demographic headwinds, like Japan, but in terms of reaching the, the, the frontier of technology and making everybody in the society somewhat prosperous, there's a long way to go. Second reason is that the Chinese have the Japanese experience to look at and to understand. And they also have the American experience of 2008, 2009. So they can compare the different ways, different policy responses. And in a, in a nutshell, without going into a different topic, um, you know, I think policy errors were made in Japan because the Japanese authorities in the 1990s were not aggressive enough in tackling the underlying non-performing loan problem, marking assets to market, uh, restructuring the assets, and getting new capital, recapitalizing the banking system. Um, they are tough things for governments to do. And I think a lot in China will hinge on if there are big problems in the real estate sector and the banking sector, whether the Chinese government is prepared to tackle them quite aggressively. And when I hear about different institutions actually defaulting in China, um, that actually makes me feel a little bit more optimistic that they are letting actually some of these issues uh, be dealt with in a painful way, but in a necessary way. Thank you. Any question? Yes, please. Um, I'm Yuri with the Associated Press. Um, this is like a really basic and probably a dumb question, but <laughs> since we got you here, um, I'd like to ask, like, what you seem to be saying is that the QE and the QQE that the Bank of Japan did was this really wonderful thing, and they were kind of ahead of their time. And, you know, I'm kind of surprised because we're not really used to hearing that here. <laughs> we're used to hearing, like, you know, Japan's got this, like, mounds of, like, uh, public debt, and that means that they're... Um, really like a zombie and stupid. But I mean, are they really that brilliant? And if so, I mean, who's the guy that should to be taking credit for that? And you know, is Japan going to be, are you the only one praising Japan or, or what's, what's going to happen? <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting question. Um, that's very interesting. Uh, so let me first of all say, OK, the, 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 the positive side of the balance sheet is if you look, so if you ask the question, who? Who invented quantitative easing? Um, the Bank of Japan. Uh, who adopted quantitative easing later on? Ah, oh, the Federal Reserve, Bank of England, the ECB, uh, Bank of Australia, Reserve Bank of Australia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you look at another uh, uh, very fundamental uh, policy tool of central banks now, it's called forward guidance. The idea that central banks uh, signal to the market their intention about the future course of monetary policy. Uh, so they might make it quite explicit and say that they will not raise the interest rate until the unemployment rate comes down to a certain level. The Bank of England did that several years ago. Or it might be, uh, again, linked to the labor market, that they will not raise the interest rate or reverse QE until substantial improvement has happened in the labor market, etc. That's called forward guidance. Guess who invented forward guidance? The Bank of Japan. Uh, it, that was an integral part of its initial quantitative easing. And if you go back to 2001, when the Bank of Japan announced quantitative easing, uh, they didn't call it quantitative easing at the time. They, they called it a change in their operating procedures. Yeah. Uh, but effectively, it was to increase current account balances, which at the time were a little bit less than five trillion. Uh, they increased it gradually over time to uh, th about 33 trillion, 33 to 35 trillion. Uh, so a substantial increase. They said that they would continue with this uh, paradigm until the CPI was back in positive territory on a consistent basis. 
Uh, similarly, with the QQE under Governor Kuroda, there is a very important forward guidance component in there, which is essentially to say that until the CPI is back above 2%, it will actually overshoot 2%, which it's doing at the moment, but it has to overshoot and be above 2% on a consistent, stable basis. Uh, they will continue to expand their balance sheet or in increase the monetary base. So uh, who invented forward guidance? The Bank of Japan. Who then has adopted forward guidance as you know, one of the most important, pivotal aspects of monetary policy? Uh, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the ECB, et cetera, et cetera. Credit easing, a big uh, new idea in central banking is this idea of credit easing as well. We saw that in a big way during the financial crisis. If you go back to uh, Governor Fukui's term as central bank, uh, governor in 2003, I think it was uh, April 2003, if I remember correctly, uh, he, the Bank of Japan under Governor Fukui, just after he came in, uh, launched a new program of where the Bank of Japan would buy asset-backed securities outright. And those asset-backed securities have a sort of credit risk. So at the time, this was kind of revolutionary. Wow, the Bank of Japan is taking private sector credit risk onto its balance sheet. Um, so again, who invented credit easing? Bank of Japan. Who adopted credit easing later on? All the major central banks. So I think... Um, there is a, a case to be made that, you know, give credit where credit is due. Now, who, who was the brain behind that? I mean, I don't know exactly. I think uh, Professor Wader, I think, was a policy board member at the time, if I remember correctly. I think he probably had some input. But there are a lot of brainy people at the Bank of Japan. I mean, in the policy departments, I think the Bank of Japan, if you look at the schemes that they've come out with, uh, over the years, they're very, they're quite clever and well thought out. Um, hats off to to, 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 to to those people. That's the positive side of the balance sheet. The negative side of the balance sheet is, um, I alluded to the errors that were made with fiscal policy, uh, but there were also errors made with monetary policy because even though the Bank of Japan introduced and pioneered many of those. Uh, new concepts and new operating procedures, they did it in a very, on a very small scale. And I argued at the time, and have continued to argue, in a very timid way. So if you look at the, that, that first period of quantitative easing, uh, the Bank of Japan didn't target the overall size of the balance sheet. They targeted just the current account balance component. So going from Five trillion to 35 trillion, that's a seven times increase, sounds pretty good. Um, but the overall balance sheet only increased by about 45% over a five year period. That was just not enough to really move the needle on inflation and inflation expectations. If you look at what happened in the global financial crisis, now admittedly, it was a financial crisis, desperate times. But the Federal Reserve, even before it announced its own QE program, had doubled the size of its balance sheet. It's a 100% increase in two or three months. And I could go on and on. So the problem with the Bank of Japan, until Governor Kuroda came along, was that the measures they were adopting were on too small a scale. And also, the communication was not strong enough. It was sort of ambiguous. It, was, it lacked confidence. Um, so it wasn't really ef effective. Add to that the fact that fiscal policy at every early opportunity was consolidating. That meant that uh, the, the, the monetary policy was facing these fiscal contraction headwinds. Now, I don't want to let the Bank of Japan off the hook too much, blaming fiscal policy, uh, because to the extent that the Bank of Japan commented on fiscal policy, and central banks typically are very reluctant to do that because they worry that if they talk about fiscal policy, they might put their independence at risk. Um, but to the extent that they did talk about fiscal policy, even under Governor Kuroda, it was supportive of the fiscal contraction uh, plans of the government. So yes, credit where credit's due, but also, um, you know, we have to be critical of the, the way in which these policies were deployed. Thank you.
Yes, any more questions? Mr. Uchita. san Please come this way. My name is Mr. Chida. I'm from Hayaka Publishing. First of all, we are uh, pleased to be your Japanese publisher, and thank you very much for inviting me and Mr. Hayakawa to this session. Uh, my question is, apart from your lecture today, but uh, you referred in your book that uh, uh, the issue of disparity of the rich and the poor are getting bigger and bigger these days, and uh, Elon Musk, uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, these guys are almost uh, monopolizing wealth in a way. How do you approach uh, this issue from a viewpoint of uh, expert of money? Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chida. And again, oh, thank you very much to Hayakawa Shobo. Delighted that you'll be publishing the, the, the book in, in Japanese. I can't wait to, to see it. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So there's a, you know, a chapter in, in my book. It's not just about monetary policy. It's about money. And uh, you, you know, a big issue with money is disparities in income and wealth, because that is, is money. And you know, look. It's, there's a big issue about inequality. You know, Thomas Piketty wrote a famous book, Capitalism in the 21st Century, and you know, there's, there's a chorus of people worrying about inequality. What I decided to do in the chapter on inequality was perhaps offer a different perspective. And, uh, you know, of course, one has to be compassionate about people that, um, you know, have, have very low income, et cetera. But the question really becomes, how do you address that issue? And um, you know, attacking the rich and taxing the rich is probably not the best way to do it. And you know, what I point out, you mentioned Jeff Bezos, for example. Um, you know, so you look at these people now; you might call them the uber rich. Uh, so, Jeff Bezos, the the, the uh, net worth of people like Jeff Bezos fluctuates, but you know, maybe something like 180 billion dollars, you know, a billion is a thousand million. So these are, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, maybe 120 billion, Elon Musk, you know, again, fluctuates wildly, but, you know, up there in the kind of around about 200 billion. So these are enormous amounts of money. But, and it's very easy to say, well, hold on, we, we, we should t take that money and, and, and redistribute it to, to poorer people. Um, but then you say to yourself, what exactly is that where does that money come from? And particularly for those sort of uh, you know, entrepreneurs, internet kind of entrepreneurs, most of their net worth is uh, this stock market capitalization of Amazon and Facebook and these other companies. And that, you, you might say, well, that's kind of paper wealth. But what it essentially is, is the stock market's evaluation today of the future stream of profits that those companies will generate, discounted back to the present. And those profits are really coming from uh, satisfied customers. And even when you think about it, the stock market is a kind of a, a, one of these miracles of human invention. Um, even people who have not been born, the purchases that they're going to make with money in the future is already being discounted back into the stock price today of companies and showing up as wealth of these entrepreneurs. Um, so what I tried to g get the point across, Mr. Chida, in that chapter is that to a large extent the inequalities that we see when we look at these numbers are being generated as the result of a process of you know, prosperity generation. Nobody is forcing anybody to buy an iPhone. <laughs> Um, not very attractive looking one compared to the ones you have in Japan. Um, you know, people voluntarily are embracing these, these technologies. So much of the uber wealth disparities come from that point, of, from that perspective. Now, I mentioned taxation. You know, you do hear from time to time um, people saying, and politicians who say, well, we should have a wealth tax. And again, you could have a little mental experiment of saying, well, what if we took yeah, a hundred billion dollars of Jeff Bezos's money. He'd still have, you know, maybe eighty billion left. That's enough, surely. He doesn't need that extra hundred billion. 
And with that 100 billion, we could do all sorts of wonderful things. Maybe we could end homelessness and build all these houses. And that's a little bit too simplistic. And two kind of, well, two reasons leap out. One is that, and, you know, take homelessness, for example. What you need there is not the money that Jeff Bezos has, but the resources, the real resources, the labor, the raw materials, uh, the equipment, and everything else. That's what we need you know, to build houses, to, to house homeless people. And so you need money to do that, but uh, the government can, can create that money, as we've talked about, and I talked about earlier in the book. Now, how, so the government actually, you know, it, it, the idea that the government doesn't have the money, that's not the right answer. The government can create the money. Now, if the, what about if you took the 100 billion from Jeff Bezos? Well, taking 100 billion from Be Jeff Bezos, first of all, it would probably have a, a dramatic effect on the stock market <laughs> um, because you can't take $100 billion of market cap out of Amazon and give it to the government without having a dramatic effect on Amazon stock price and probably the stock price of every you know, similar company in the world because they'd say, oh my god, you know, my wealth is going to be taken. But the real issue that you need to think about is if you took that $100 billion, would that free up the necessary resources to you know, build all those houses that you want to build? And the answer is no, because very rich people have what economists call a very low marginal propensity to consume. In other words, they've, they're rich, they've got what they want, the extra money is just sitting in paper wealth, and taking some of that paper wealth away uh, doesn't actually free up many resources. I mean, if Jeff Bezos has six houses, maybe he gives one up. That's one house. We need 100,000 houses. So um, that's kind of the, the sort of story I tell in that, in that chapter, that perhaps if we have to accept the fact that a certain amount of wealth inequality will be generated as a natural part of the process of generating prosperity in a market economy, and that if the government wants to engage in sort of income redistribution, there are probably some kind of simple ways to do that that it has under its control, and it shouldn't be saying, well, we don't have the money. Now, they have the money, they may not have the resources. And here's the tricky part of the problem is that the economy should be at full employment. That's the job of the central bank and the government to make sure the economy is at full employment. So if suddenly the government launches some new expenditure program, military or social welfare, whatever, um, it can create the money, no problem. But that's going to lead to inflation because now you're going to be commanding with that money more resources, additional resources, but the economy is already at full employment, so there are no, there are no additional resources. So what's going to happen? The central bank, primarily, will have to tighten monetary policy, and that will lead across the whole economy for people to pull back a little bit on their economic activity. That will free up the resources, which will then, indirectly, be used in this new program. Milton Friedman famously called this no free lunch. So I'm sorry, economists are often the bearers of this more pessimistic news, but um, it's, 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 it's a kind of complicated issue. But thank you for that excellent question. Thank you. Our club uh, receives uh, donations. I mean, we are allowed to receive donations, so we don't mind $1 billion from this 180. Uh, we can use it for the freedom of press and spreading in, in Japan and yeah, in the of world. Of course, Thank I you. cannot speak for Mr. Bezos. <laughs> if you speak about that, please remember us here. Thank you very much. Um, before we close the session, I, I have uh, two small uh, questions, actually. One is about the dollar-yen value. How do you think this is influenced by the financial policy of Bank of Japan? And secondly, it's, it's a little bit complicated, the frozen money in central banks by the sanctions. For example, Iran, I think, has a few billion dollars frozen in Japan and a lot of Russian money frozen in all over the world. How do you think this money is used? Thank you. Uh, right, well, the, 
two, uh, two great questions. So the, the yen dollar exchange rate, um, yes, it definitely is influenced by um, Bank of Japan monetary policy. Um, and I, I have another chapter in my book on sort of the international aspects of, of money, which we haven't really talked about, but that obviously involves the, the exchange rate. Um, and there's a, uh, there's a little sort of uh, very important sort of uh, rule or, or, or theorem in uh, international economics called Mundell's uh, Impossible Trinity, which basically says that a country cannot have uh, a, an, open, uh, an open capital account, money coming in and out, a fixed exchange rate, uh, and uh, its own independent monetary control. It's control of its domestic monetary conditions. It has to give one of those up. And most countries sort of uh, make the trade-off by saying, well, we want to have money going in and out of the economy. We want to have an open capital account. We also want to maintain our domestic monetary control. So in other words, that the, the Bank of Japan's policy can be insulated from, say, the Fed's policy or from Bank of England's policy or whatever. And in order to do that, you need to have a, a freely floating or a flexible exchange rate. And so most countries have adopted that paradigm. And if you really sort of believe that, um, essentially you, you, you would have to take the view that, well, we really shouldn't worry about the exchange rate. I mean, the exchange rate is, is going to move up and down. It's going to do what it's going to do. It's driven by countless you know, investors and traders uh, and tourists and companies worldwide. And it's a little bit like a, a boy floating on the ocean. I like to use that metaphor. It'll just sometimes drift in one direction, it'll drift back again, etc. You can't really control it, and you shouldn't control it according to that fundamental theorem in international economics. Um, so, but but what the situation in Japan, of course, is the yen has moved from you know maybe 100 to 110, 120, now 145, heading to 150, and the temptation is to kind of step in and try to do something. But you know probably you want to resist the temptation to focus directly on the exchange rate and rather focus on the, 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 the domestic fundamental issues. And so what's causing that, that widening to a large extent is the differential in monetary policy that the Fed, as I mentioned before, and other central banks have raised their interest rates because you know, inflation's high, they're trying to get that under control, they've raised their interest rate. The Bank of Japan is still stuck at the zero interest rate bound and is still doing QQE. But you know, I think most people expect and hope over the next year to two that, or maybe even much, maybe six months, maybe one month, that process of the Bank of Japan being able to declare success on achieving its inflation target uh, and to start to you know, tighten monetary policy for the first time really in you know, 30 years maybe, that process will begin. Um, you know, people are now looking at the Fed and saying, is this the peak of interest rates? Maybe next year the U.S. economy slows down, maybe goes into recession. The Fed will start to cut interest rates, and the Bank of Japan might be hiking interest rates. Uh, and that, of course, will lead the yen, because of the interest rate differential, to move uh, you know, in a stronger direction. So, um, you know, again, I think, I think no, it's... It, it's a little bit, the, worrying about the exchange rate is a little bit like shooting the messenger. It's really a necessary part of, the, of, of that free market economy. On, on the frozen exchange rates, um, I do mention this uh, towards the end of the book, um, <coughs> pardon me, and you know, it gets into geopolitical territory and a different kind of set of topics, but viewed from a kind of a narrow economic perspective, um, it, I think it's a very bad idea. And you know we have a, a situation where the U.S. dollar is regarded or is the dominant global reserve currency. Now, again, I won't go into what is a reserve currency, how does it become a reserve currency, but people like to use the dollar for trading, for invoicing, for financing, etc. And that brings many benefits to the U.S. Um, but if and that what that means is that many countries end up with U.S. dollar foreign exchange reserves. Japan has a big pile. China has a big pile. Saudi Arabia, um, uh, Russia, etc. Now, if from time to time, for geopolitical purposes, the US turns around and says, oh, we're going to grab those reserves. We're going to freeze that money. That's not your money anymore. We're going to use that money for some other purpose, such as 
reconstruction in Ukraine. That is, it seems, seems to me, a very short-sighted policy from an economic point of view and will cause a, you know, will set in train a series of reactions uh, among countries that up until now have been very willing to use the US dollar as a reserve currency, there'll be a reluctance to do so. And I think we're already seeing things happening in the world in, you know, around China, Russia, Iran, BRICS, uh, where people are having these conversations. I was actually, when those sanctions in Russia were applied, um, was interviewed by the S uh, South China Morning Post, and I made the comment, which I'll put on the public record here, that I can't believe that the Fed and the, and the Treasury were in the room when those decisions were taken. Because if they had been, they should have said, Mr. President, no, please don't do this. This is not, you can do a whole lot of other things, but this will not be in the national interest of the US to uh, bring into question the integrity of the US dollar as the dominant reserve currency. So um, thank you for the question. Um, it takes me a little bit out of my comfort zone, but I think uh, it, it, it is an issue that needs to be debated more. Well, thank you very much for your insights. Uh, very educational and very exciting. Uh, please, ladies and gentlemen, uh, give a big hand to our speaker today, Paul Schert, for his great insight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't you have Australian dollar? <laughs> no, <laughs> I do, <laughs> but not, not with me here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>